it's an excellent, and I had the time uh, and a chance uh, to read, it's a very rich uh, and vivid account of the impact of the pandemic, why it happened, but also the aftermath or uh, what we think uh, that when the, the pandemic has faded into the background, uh, the pandemic is not really truly over, uh, but it feels like it is truly over because we have made it to feel that it, uh, it has uh, been over. The, the variety and the richness of the contributions uh, uh, in this volume, uh, they showed us, and I think they br bring us in very stark terms, uh, how the pandemic was such a traumatic and also transformative uh, uh, event. Um, and it, it does in a, in a beautiful way. There are, uh, there's poetry, there are, there are, there's art, uh, there's a, a, a photo story by, led by donkeys, uh, and there are extraordinary contributions by practitioners, by academics, uh, by people who are in the thick of it, uh, that really uh, bring the, the story and the impact of the pandemic uh, uh, really well. And I think this important book does three things very, very well. Uh, firstly, and I think this is the main message uh, of this volume, is it shows us the unequal impact of the pandemic. Um, we all have memories uh, of the pandemic. For most of us, it was uh, a traumatic event, or at the very least, a very strange moment uh, in our lives. This was a moment where our lives shrunk, become much smaller. Uh, we were confined uh, at home. Uh, but many of us also lost loved ones. Uh, many people are still living with the impact uh, of low, co uh, low COVID. Uh, we saw the impact in our children uh, too. They lost more than a year uh, of learning. They lost essentially the ability to socialize, to go out, to fall in love, to learn about uh, life uh, as you go out. And instead they, they were locked up at home uh, with their parents uh, and unable uh, to learn. Um, and we also saw how the pandemic affected different groups of society very differently. We had uh, those, those of us, and I was one of the privileged ones who could work from home, uh, and so I was protected uh, from the effects uh, of the pandemic. Uh, but the pandemic exposed those vast inequalities uh, in our societies, uh, and those, uh, the, the fault lines were very, very much around class, around race uh, and around socioeconomic and also uh, differences in terms of if you were uh, able-bodied or not. So uh, some groups were more vulnerable uh, and the groups that were more vulnerable also tended to be the ones who were more exposed. They tended to be quite often the key, or the key workers, those essential workers that were sent to the front line of the pandemic, pretty much like soldiers were sent to the First World War, to the trenches, almost as cannon fodder. And in many cases, for instance, uh, the care workers uh, who were sent, were working in the care homes uh, uh, in England uh, and Wales without any uh, pro pro uh, protective uh, equipment, any, any kind of protection, they were really exposed. Uh, and the, the degree of irresponsibility in the way that uh, the, care, uh, the, the, the management of care uh, was done was Criminal. Uh, I think criminal is not a, a, a word I say uh, lightly. So you are far more likely to die uh, of COVID-19 if you belong to uh, an ethnic minority, if you're poor, uh, if you're older, and if you're also differently abled. And we also saw how these inequalities were uh, also expressed in the global in global politics. The countries of the, the global north uh, were able to hoard all the PPE the ventilators, and then later on uh, the vaccines, and then the countries of the world, well, the, the countries of the global south were literally left to fend for themselves uh, without PPE and still without uh, vaccines. So an extremely unequal uh, pandemic that left not only exposes inequalities, but exacerbated those inequalities in society. The book also does ver another very important job, which was to do the one of remembering the ways a, a variety of people experienced this very transformational uh, event. And I was very moved by the very different accounts of how people uh, grieved the victims of COVID-19, and also of those who were part of the front line uh, of fighting uh, uh, the pandemic. And it was literally that kind of front line as we saw uh, in, uh, uh, in other wars. 
uh, this work and th does it extremely well and we really need to remember uh, that impact, not only because uh, the people who suffered, the people who died, the victims, uh, they deserve to be remembered, but also uh, they need to be remembered so that we actually we avoid the repetition uh, of uh, what we saw, all the mistakes that were, the mistakes and the irresponsibility that took place during that, that year. Thirdly, I think the book does another very important thing, which is to discuss uh, the way that the pandemic changed our politics. Um, and it shows us the, pot the potential to change uh, politics for the better. And Gary Young, in his uh, afterward, uh, he wrote that for all the trauma, COVID-19 has gifted us with the opportunity to rethink the way we do things. Uh, and I think that many of the contributions in the volume show that such a rethinking uh, is uh, underway. Uh, it showed us, the pandem this pandemic showed us uh, how decades of cuts to public services, and namely uh, the healthcare systems, uh, and also the, the preparations for the pandemic, left many healthcare systems completely unable to cope uh, with the demands of managing uh, the <coughs> pandemic. Uh, and from <coughs> Paul, who is here uh, with us, uh, she wrote in a contribution that if a, fa a government fails you in a disaster, then it is quietly failing you all the time. So this is a reminder of all the problems, of all the uh, system problems that already existed and that have been <coughs> exposed, and that oh, hopefully will open the space for a, a discussion and a rethinking and a reset of how our societies, our politics uh, are uh, organized. So hopefully from this book we're going to have this a, a discussion of how uh, our uh, political systems, our societies uh, can reimagine a different role uh, for the state and this would be a role for the state, a role for a state that listens, that cares, as opposed to be just one that regulates and, and polices uh, the way uh, that we live. Um, Lucy Isho, Professor Lucy Isho, but who's also here with us, um, in her intervention, she, she talks about uh, that we've been asked to move on and that we should uh, somehow uh, move on. But at the same time, she talks about the need to also to give them hell. And I think what she means by the giving them uh, hell is to make sure that those, that they, those that are in power, actually do not forget what happened and actually act in a way that prevents uh, mistakes, th the same tragedies from happening uh, again. So I encourage you to uh, read this fantastic uh, volume. Uh, it has brilliant uh, analysis, uh, very poignant uh, uh, testimonies, and, uh, and I hope that the interventions tonight uh, will whet your appetite and uh, you'll go home with uh, a copy, and not only a copy to have in your bookshelf, but a copy actually for you to read. Not necessarily just to remember uh, what the, those traumatic years that we experienced, but also to give us the tools to demand more uh, of our politics. So before I open the floor I to the other speakers, um, I think I would like to finish by remembering uh, the penultimate lines of the, the, the poem of Jennifer Mustafa's, that's the, the poem that opens the volume. Um, and I think it's, I hope that th these last lines will put us in, the, in the, the mindset for our discussion, but also in the mindset to rethink the impact of the pandemic. And so she wrote, so we tell ourselves that this ends, that if this ends, that when this ends, there will be new beginnings. But one thing that happened as soon as we started to see what the emergency plan has called the Canary Wharf cough around the end of 2019, something was very wrong, we started to read. And people think that we read plans, and we, we, we've long ago learned that the plans get easily overlooked. What we actually read is books. And I was going back to folios on the Black Death, and I was going to 1918 novels, and I was looking at things, and um, the wonderful work of um, Mark Hollingsbury is with us today on, on learning from Enza and all of these kind of things. And I was reading, and I don't sleep terribly well when we're in the middle of a disaster, and I was reading, and I was putting it all together. And I still can't believe I can hold this in my hands, because what I can tell you as an emergency planner is we will need these books again. Yeah. And I am so incredibly in, in debt to the other three women that they were able to work with us to to pull this together and all of the contributors so that it existed. And just little things, like we're, we're right in the middle of lockdown, 
I've, I've got small children, it's all going bananas. And every week there would be a diary appointment from Candida to go in the diary so that this would happen. And it was the one thing that just kept going. There was energy. Other projects would fail away. At the start of the pandemic, people were applying for ESRC bids and they were going to do... And this project kept going. And I like to think actually that was because the fates were involved and they thought this book will be needed. And I said, although I've had my proof copies, I'm still, as you see, sat here just holding it that it exists. So thank you, girls. I really, really appreciate it. Because the thing that I think bound us from the earliest point was we were not going to forget. And also one of the things that bound us together very early on was we were comfortable with different, not ever perspectives, I would say we were very much joined, but also that we could hold, as Sue Black says so beautifully in the foreword, we could hold um, two truths at once. What a wonderful thought. It's kind of what academic rigor used to be about, that you might be able to bring challenge to the idea of something like um, forcibly locking people in their homes while simultaneously recognising how terrible the virus was. So this anthology was was deliberately holding different different concepts all at the same time. And every time a new contribution would come in, and I would physically be taken aback by the power in it, I would absolutely be blown away. And I, I taught myself not to fall in love with the images because I knew what a publisher would say. They would say there can't be images in this book because we can't afford to put images in the book. So every time an attachment came through with images and people would be like, look at this, can you believe how beautiful it is? I'd be like, don't fall in love with it, don't fall in love with it because the publishers will take it away from us. And I really want to thank Bristol University Press for putting the images in there as well and allowing us to use them. And I, I urge you um, to look at them in their full colour as well. I'm sure we can make that, that a thing because they are so incredibly beautiful. And I just wanted to, to, um, to really draw you in with a few things because one of the things about the pandemic that's unusual, I think, for me is what sets a few thousand of us apart in the country and then a few more in, in the world is that the pandemic was the most planned for risk in British history. Did I always think I would see some sort of pandemic? Yes, otherwise what was I doing? <laughs> you know, so I, I always thought we would see something. And some things have been so much more resilient than I expected. And one of those areas actually was death care, because that's what my fellowship has been in since 2006, the care of the dead after the pandemic. And Sue Black says in her wonderful foreword that um, it is not only the living that requires support, and I know only too well the challenges of caring for the dead. Such work passes without comment, almost as if society was afraid to name and recognise it. Death is not a failure and something of shame, it is a reality. And it is the mark of a civilised society that this duty is performed with trust and dignity away from public eyes. That was done, that work was done by practitioners without any guidance that would guide them through. They reached back to old plans, they reached back to old friends to ensure that however bad it got, they would always do what they could do. And that's why I'd also like to read something from the incredible Lara Rose um, Iredale. Since um, 2000, I have campaigned for um, the protection and the return of personal effects at disaster scenes, air crashes, tsunamis. And all of a sudden, I found myself doing the same in hospitals. So as Lara Rose writes, how to deal with the property of the deceased soon became a major issue. This was something that I'd never really given a second thought about. It wasn't something I saw. It was the bereavement office that dealt with it. But as it turns out, people bring a lot of their own property to hospital with them. Clothes, books, electronics, personal hygiene products, so much more. And this property all needs to be returned to the family. With the death of a patient, these items are no longer just comfort that make a lengthy hospital stay more pleasant, they are now the last link between the living and the dead. We can't judge based on the financial value of the items what is valuable to relatives in these circumstances, especially when the hospital is close to visitors and families are not allowed to physically be close to their dying. A hairbrush, a signature fragrance, birthday cards, an heirloom piece of jewellery, receipts from the last meal shared together, everything is to be made available to return. When she sent the first draft of that, I had to sit with it for some time because that had been my life's work, but that was still at the point 
but ministers and civil servants and colleagues were telling me that the pandemic was not the D word. It was not a disaster. It had not met the threshold of a disaster. And it was Lara Rose's words there that convinced me that I would fight that with every sinew that I had. We were now in disaster territory and the bereaved would be disaster bereaved. But what I've also learned with 20 something years of seeing terrible, unnecessary, unfair bereavement and the fight that comes after that is that you have to also provide a path to see what changes and it doesn't come from the traditional thoughts. So the anthology that gives me the most, the part of the anthology that gives me the most fire in my belly is from my beloved colleague Matt who found the strength as with so many emergency planners to go again we're now planning for the next pandemic. We, these are not empty promises when we say we will try. And so to read that section and take some fragile, friable hope, because the inquiry will not deliver that, the changes in any law, the, the empty day that the select committee comes up with some word soup, none of those will deliver change. The bricolage is done at local level. By local planners and what I've discovered when I put when the dust settles out is people didn't even know that was there so if you don't know that it's there you don't see how we fight every time for difference because we did protect the personal effects we didn't in mid Staffordshire we didn't in some of our earlier hospital inquiries sometimes we failed even this time but each time planners go again so take some faith from that and thank you to the planners for their work in summary, it's been, and, and it's strange to say when I've also got my other book out the same week, and this is a heavy week of anniversaries. The very first time I felt the crushing weight of a failed response was working in the Iraq conflict, the 20 year anniversary this week. And so one of the things that I would say is that I, it really does mean something when I say this is the greatest achievement of my of my publishing life. I am so, so proud to have curated or just really <laughs> thank three other people for, for, for sending me such amazing stuff, but to have cur curated something so special and so important. And I commend it to you. And I'm, I'm, I'm pleased it exists. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am, um, you know, it's extraordinary how worlds collide because. I know Lara Rose from my working in the funeral industry. I know Lucy from having read her book and following her on Twitter. And I'm here because my husband died from COVID. And, and, and that's why I'm here, because Steve died. And it was absolutely shit. Because I protected him. He had prostate cancer, and I knew very early on, I, I, I'm in the funeral sector, I saw what was happening, I saw it coming across Europe um, in January, I told him that this was really serious and we needed, to be, we needed to be aware of what was happening. By February he was handing in his notice at work, and by March we'd moved back from where we were living, so that I was back near my children. So when lockdown happened, I was, we were based where my family were. Um, I knew that if Steve contracted COVID, he would not be a priority because he was 65 and he had a terminal diagnosis, but he was healthy. He was living with prostate cancer. And the day that we got married in September 2020, he was already positive for COVID. We didn't know that. So we were married for three weeks. For the three weeks of our marriage, he was dying. Um, he was in hospital, I was at home, I had COVID, he was dying in hospital. And as a consequence of what happened to us, I found the campaign group, the COVID Bereaved Families for Justice. And two of my fellow um, members of that group are here tonight, so Amanda, Kirsten, and we've got others who are watching online. And as a result of that, we ended up being invited to become part of the volunteers who created the National COVID Memorial Wall, which has become the most iconic, internationally recognised grassroots memorial 
for the 220,000 people who died in the UK. Just pause for a moment and, and hold that number. It's unbelievable and it's unforgivable because we have been failed by the people that were put in charge, that we have the worst possible leaders at the worst possible time. Coming back to this book, which somehow encapsulates and embodies so much that has happened to us, we've all been traumatised by what's happened. And this book is the most powerful, the most powerful read, probably that I've ever read. It's so comprehensive. It's so wide in its scope. It's, it's taught me so much. I've come out of my bubble of absolute pain and grief and understood how different communities were, were, were so badly affected. I was like tunnel vision looking at what happened to me. This book has opened my eyes. And the one thing that resonated with me, and the one thing out of this extraordinary amazing book, there's one phrase of two words which has actually really impacted me. And it's probably really minor in the grand scheme of things because there's so much else in this book. But the one thing that, that stuck with me was that we shouldn't talk about ethnic minorities. We should talk about global majorities. Mm -hmm. We speak from a position of white privilege almost entirely in this room. And we talk about ethnic minorities. How fucking dare we? How dare we? That really stuck in my head. But the, the book I commend to everybody is so, so powerful. And I'm so privileged to have been asked to write a chapter. So thank you, Candida, for inviting me to do so. Um, it's my privilege to have written on behalf of my fellow volunteers. And we work on behalf of all of the bereaved families in this country. So thank you to you. Thank you to you. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, everyone. I feel um, very honoured to be invited. I'm going to cry. I'm gonna <laughs> just <laughs> it's kind of saying, I promise I'm not going to, but I will. So I feel very honoured. I found, um, I'll, talk, I'll talk about the book a little bit later, but um, just to all the contributors, it's magical, um, is the first thing that I'd say. Um, I was struck by something when I can't remember who was talking. Is at the beginning of the pandemic, I was writing. I was actually just writing. I started writing about Grenfell. I didn't live in Grenfell at the time of the fire. I'd left in 2014, watched it burn, um, promised to ensure that we'd learn, and then realised we weren't going to. So I started writing and met Lucy, and you know. Um, I think everybody here probably has some connection on that level, but this very wise woman that I knew, I was talking to her at the beginning of the pandemic, and she does a lot of work with um, tribes in the Amazon, and one of them had said to her, it's the world telling us to stop and breathe. Mm -hmm. um, and then I try and uh, always try and move beyond the number because every single heart on the wall is the depth of pain that you shared. And I haven't been able to go to the COVID memorial and then I thought, I have to go because I find, um, I just find it sometimes overwhelming. So I've kind of learned how to put boundaries around myself and grief. But then because this was happening, I was down at the South Bank. So I thought, let me go. And I could only walk a third. Mm. I just got to only walk a third because it's there's something about you have to move beyond the number. And if you move beyond the number and you try and imagine the pain, it becomes overwhelming. But if we don't stay connected to the pain, I don't think we'll change. So it's about... I mean, that like, feels like my life, and I think, Lucy, <laughs> you kind of navigate that so well, is how to keep that balance of, of going into the pain um, sufficiently to give you energy 
anger, um, but also beauty, you know, because mm. there's also some, some beauty in there. I also do think when I was thinking about the Amazon, when I was thinking about that, is we are seeing the same things with climate change. Mm -hmm. So I think we almost are in, yeah. you know, there's something, there's something with the temporality of things that's changing. So, you know, there's an immediate disaster and then there's COVID, that's two, three years, but then there's climate change that we are feeling, but the you know, the crack lines that are exposed and so beautifully expressed in the book are being felt through climate change. We were talking about that, yeah. you know. So I think that's that's just one thing that I wanted to share. I also, I, I, I find reading difficult. For some reason, mm. post grandfather I can't read. I can watch, like, crappy TV, but I can't <laughs> read. It's like something that's like when there's, when, when my brain's still, it can't, it just... The thoughts just get too overwhelming, so it was really confronting for me <laughs> to read the book. Um, but actually, after I went to the memorial that weekend, it was last weekend, so I kind of like had to do it, right? But I just, it's an unbelievable testament and honouring of, of each of the people that died. And I would, it's so beautiful in the... Um, holistic experience because there's art and there's poetry and there's you know argue I mean I learned so much like you I mean it's just like fascinated like oh my god really you do this and you do that so it's like educational um, but my experience was being recreated on some level mm. of that I think we all have lived through this experience that we don't talk about and can't articulate and is in many cases beyond words. And I think the, the, the book and, you know, just kudos to all the contributors, the editing, I think it's absolutely brilliantly elegant in, in, in how it's crafted. But what strikes me is the experience of it. Mm. It's just like sitting with the experience which we've all sat with and to various degrees of um, impact, I suppose. And then I think, um, the other thing, I, I don't want to talk for too long, but the other thing is I really do believe in and have been spending a lot of time now thinking about what I call the transformative power of grief. Um, is our ability to hold on to the pain mm. is what drives us going forward. So I would just really... I worry that we're not doing that enough. I worry that we're plastering over and moving on from the grief. Um, and I think we need to create spaces like the memorial wall, but also in conversation to be able to open up those wounds. And if we don't, I'm worried about what will happen. On the other side of, of hope, uh, I think something's changed in the psyche, mm. that things are no longer acceptable. Mm. I, I would put down the uh, um, strikes, etc., etc., to to something that's altered in in what we deem acceptable and what's not acceptable, and a lot of that is around the, the inequality of risk about you know the who's who's most impacted by these things, and then the one thing I read the other day that I'm going to end with is I think we need to learn how to care at scale mm. and I can't remember where I read that but I read it and it resonated with the book and I think we need to get more political and smarter and learn how to care at scale I've got a question, I'm not quite sure who this is directed at but it's a question around the kinds of things which have been we've talked a lot about the opportunity for change um, and and that's, that's, that seems to be really important and, you know, 
a justification as to why we need this now, um, that we, we don't just kind of return to normal. But there was also so much about the pandemic that accelerated certain kinds of normality. Um, for us, many of us in this room, um, this was the first time that we, we really moved wholeheartedly to the digital. Mm. And um, that seems to me to be something that's working in quite the opposite direction. And I suppose my question is really about the, how the opportunity for kind of resistance to that that also comes out of that same moment. So, uh, have the, the authors considered the research that were done by frontline charities during 2020-21? Academia seems to ignore that work. Mm. I think perhaps there's something to be said about this volume. Well, so speaking for the editors, um, you, we actually uh, were very keen to incorporate uh, a lot of as many perspectives as we could. One of the practical constraints is that you'll notice that, for example, the, the academic reflective studies or research studies were um, quite time bounded. So one of the things that was difficult was there were studies starting that we would have liked to include that we, we couldn't. As anybody knows about a, a book manuscript, we were already into the proof stage. The other thing that I would point is that the, the question absolutely hits to the heart and it's very close to me. And you will know that the, uh, you should know that the, 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 the royalties of the book go to health charities that each of the editor selects. And mine is Latimer Community Art Therapy, which is a small children's uh, charity at the base of the Grenfell Tower, but actually had to massively upskill to uh, respond to the demands of the pandemic. So while it's, it's sort of in there implicitly, uh, it's something certainly not ignored by this <laughs> academic. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's many more volumes to, uh, to create here. And one conversation that I had with a colleague was he was being complimentary about the book and he said, you know, it's so good to see a good anthology. <laughs> that old back, the backhanded praise is there is a, I think there's a template here for how to gather that work. Um, and all of the editors, and I do certainly include myself in this part, um, worked incredibly hard, I think, to, to, try, and, um, to, to try and explore different voices and also our own lenses. One of the things I particularly love, I've worked with Jenny on a number of things now, and Jenny um, is, is a very, I think, unsung hero, really, in terms of capturing the corners mm -hmm. of After Disaster and her book, After Grenfell. Um, I've actually just started to carry it with me in my rucksack as like a talisman to remind me what bravery looks like in writing and in courage. And so Jenny um, was particularly uh, focused, I think, on, on, on on different voices and so using what I'd like to see in, in academic methodology for anthologies is using anthologies like this and after Grenfell to, to, to do more. There's absolutely more to do. Thank you. There's another question which uh, another uh, Mark Brown uh, back at home was mm. saying that um, well that the old normal wasn't great for loads of folk what normal is and was and who gets to define it and which normals come back is one of the areas yeah. of importance and the question is I think maybe the question that it is unsaid is um, are we doing something about the fact that uh, the, the normal what was the normal uh, was actually uh, pretty un imperfect uh, and uh, exposed what was the normal was extremely imperfect imperfect and unequal do you have the feeling that we are addressing uh, that very um, very unequal very uh, abnormal normal? Well, I think it comes through really strongly in the book is that what the pandemic did was shine a spotlight on what didn't work pre the pandemic in, in ways that I think has created change, whether we keep them on the agenda or not, I don't know. But I think, um, I mean, the whole narrative of get back to normal is a very problematic narrative on just like many, many levels. But I, I also want to go back to a little bit what you were saying about hope and one of the things I because there's something about a disaster if you're in a community like Greenfall and you know Lucy sent me stuff around what happens and actually it gets really worse and the fifth year anniversary was worse than any other time and you kind of think well after five years you should be better but actually it's not so I think I, I wonder how that will play out because it's so global so how does how does that post-disaster, um, I don't even want to call it recovery, that post-disaster 
uh, existence <laughs> I don't know what to call it how does that unfold will be um, interesting to see and I do think if especially in you know um, cultures where we're not good at dealing with grief or ambiguity or soul or I really worry about the impact but to hope that the community connections that were made at the beginning of Grateful still exist. Mm. So I think there is something in the fabric at a very local level. You know, everybody still has WhatsApp groups. Mm. So I think there, there's something. I mean, my, my, I, I do get the thing about, like, um, politicians should change, but I'm very cynical about change coming from there. So I think change will come much more locally. And I'm not sure whether we're strategically using those connections enough, but that would be, for me, where I think hope lives a lot. Alex? Uh, I'd like to go back to the point that was made about us being governed by the worst possible people at the worst possible time. <laughs> um, because this pandemic hit at the time of um, the rise of, the, you know, the populist right, didn't it? Mm -hmm. And I think one of, um, I don't know if you'd agree with this, but I think one of the effects of the pandemic is that now if you like, the voice of officialdom has become kind of hollowed out. Even I was, I was watching Johnson the other day, and it, it just seemed like, you know, a kid at school kind of saying, yes, but, no, but, yes, but. It's obvious the guy's lying about lying about lying about lying, you know. And um, I'm sure, I mean, I was looking at the YouGov. I'm a bit of a YouGov fanatic, and I mean... 98% of people on YouGov also think that. You know, so the implications of that for political legitimation, I mean, this is more for you, you know, because this is your thing, but that going forward are quite enormous. I mean, it'd be interesting to see what actually happens in the next election. The same in the States, of course, with Trump and injecting people with bleach. You know, and, and, that, and the, also you have that balance between you know, the official, um, you know, medical advisor, government medical advisor, or Anthony Fauci in the States, and these kind of populist windbag liars who were standing in front of you. I mean, I, every time Matt Hancock came on the television, I felt like punching it, that bloody pink tie, you know. And I mean... The it, little badge. The yeah, yeah, the little badge. You have a little badge, you know, on, on there. And I mean, I, but I'm sure I wasn't the only person who was feeling that way. Um, you know, I'm, um, I, I, but the worrying thing about that is who would want to go into politics now? Good people. Yeah, good, well, um, yeah, good people. But if you're good people, do you want to work with people like that? But, but we have to have that yeah. hope that good people mm. will rise up because, yeah, yeah. you know, what, what other hope do we have? Mm. And I think, you know, just taking it back to the existence of the war, you know, the wall is so powerful, and it's so political, and it's so unashamedly um, a rebuke to the people in government across the river. And it's an extraordinary thing to be connected to and to be responsible for, you know. Somehow we've ended up being the custodians of this extraordinary, incredible um, shout of rage and fury and grief that they can't ignore it. Um, so they're... they're I have to believe that good people will step up, because otherwise, what's the point? Mike? Yeah, just following on, um, I mean, I suppose I might be in the minority here, but I'm perhaps more sympathetic to Matt Hancock. Oh, <laughs> because, no. because I think that responsibility actually lies at the top. And like in the cabinet system, it's not clear to me that the key decisions were really being made by Matt Hancock. I saw him as the idiot who was sent yeah. out to say idiotic things. The fool guy. Um, and the fool guy for the show. I think, frankly, Boris Johnson is the one who made the most important calls and he made them wrong, wrong, wrong. But my actual question is really about the post-politics of this because there was a while, not very long ago, when Jacob Rees-Mogg, put himself in the position back to the comment of being the one who decides and he was telling us right it's time to all get back into the office and you know this is all over now and you know you've had your fun and and, and, and you know you can you can hope but you just think we were this close to having a Liz Truss run two years of Liz Truss with Jacob Rees-Mogg winding back everything 
Um, yeah, I, I struggle to to find hope in the political situations that we find ourselves in, and Trump will almost certainly be the U.S. presidential candidate in 24. It's difficult to see anyone else winning because, like last time, when they do primaries, Trump only gets a small amount of the vote, but there's no one else who gets that. The others all split it. It's another circus, and Trump runs again. You know, like, so are we... I'd like to think you were right, and the pandemic taught us that we should value experts and, and competence, but I just see the cycle repeating itself again in two years to 18 months' time, all over the world. But I think there's something in the anthology about that doesn't actually matter. <laughs> So we, we pull it right back out of, of central politics a lot. Mm. And it's that, you know, Lara Rose doesn't have any directive from anybody. It's it's the good people do good things at the worst time. And I think this is this is really important as we go in with climate adaptation and with other things as well. We may well see governments fall. You know, one thing I, I never I think people took an awful lot for granted before twenty nineteen, but one of the things I write about a lot in when the dust settles is I didn't. I was a child of Liverpool, I write about the effect that the Hillsborough disaster had on my psyche, yeah. which was the, the state was always going to fail me. Where I was going to draw my, my hope from was always going to be the WhatsApp group, it was always going to be the children's charity, it was always going to be yeah. Lara Rose working t double shifts to make sure that nobody got the wrong body. You know, sometimes, because I think that's the thing, is, is, is pe people... Um, in emergency planning, we, we are amazingly boundaried away from the big politics. I'll work with any leader. I'll annoy all of them. <laughs> I, you know, whatever regime, I will be. I'll be there telling them they're doing it wrong. Um, and sometimes, actually, the leaders that you think are the most uh, poor. We certainly did have incredibly uh, poor leadership. Um, but sometimes the kind of the the, um, the way forward is to just keep keep doing what you do, I think. And that's why I find I find Matt's writing incredibly um, powerful on that in the, in the anthology. Just, you'll, you'll, need it. you'll need it more than ever with that kind of leadership, I think. And I think also, uh, if I may, may say so, we, we are you know, professors of politics. So um, I think our attitude in a, in a classroom is actually to say, you know, this is, this is an act of resistance. Yeah. And bad, like leadership, <laughs> bad leadership does not just happen to us, uh, we yeah. essentially, we, we choose. So it is essentially our role as citizens uh, to essentially to resist the bad leaders, to propose different types of leadership, and to have pretty much those bottom-up initiatives. It's essentially, it is the, the, the neighborhood associations, it is uh, the, the regional groups, the, the groups of, uh, you know, from patients, from uh, victims, for creatives and so on, who come together and actually resist uh, the bad leaders, because also the bad leaders cannot do uh, incredible harm for very, for an a limited amount of time. I'm going to use my prerogative as chair and I'm going to ask one question because I think this is a really important one. Uh, it was uh, a comment that Jill made which is about our need to learn, to care at scale. Mm. And I was very curious to know, you know, what would that entail? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I, I, what would it take to write policies through caring at scale? I mean, it seems that we... <laughs> dehumanize everything oh, so yeah. in the in the interests of efficiency or whatever we're calling it so we take people out but what happened what would happen if oh, we did purpose. a post grainfall response that was how can we care at scale or we did a post pandemic response called how can we care at scale and we just you know the answer would emerge from grappling with the question of this. And, and what would it look like if that wasn't considered, um, you know, a kind of slightly weaker response? Well, so, exactly. you know, like it, it, you know, that's what I write about a lot is when you try and propose a compassion-based response, a response that gets down in the weeds, as we call it in a bag, gets thinks about what people need. How would that challenge existing so structures? It's this, this story, uh, so, so I have a, a 
two, two experiences with people that are very close to me with ambulances. One was with the NHS, um, with somebody that had mental health issues, and the ambulance workers sat for an hour in the back of the ambulance talking to this person, and it transformed their life. They literally were, don't give up hope, it's going to be okay. And it, you know, ended up in the scale of events, and that person is in amazing shape now. And then the other one was a privatised ambulance coming to fetch somebody who'd broken their leg, and she'd had a stroke, so she was pretty disabled anyway, and it was literally like moving a package. So... Do you know if you're if you're outsourcing an ambulance service to move packages, that's not caring at scale, but there's something in the uh, uh, the NHS is probably and also actually Lucy, you're in the whole phenomenal emergency disaster response um, community that I've had the pleasure to meet some people from post-Greenfall, is that there is this care there that's palpable. And if you're at the effect of a disaster, you know which one you're dealing with within a minute. Mm. And we get it squashed out of us. You know, we, we planned for many more than 220,000, which is a strange thing to say. But I imagine what our plans would have looked like if we'd had to draw them as red hearts with a name and a message underneath. And I still think about that because I, I'm sure, like my fellow planners, sometimes in the same way as you guys are talking about being asked to go back to normal, we've, we've been asked to fill in the same templates we filled in three years ago, but this time they've got names. Mm. And, you know, just like the questions say, they've got, they've got disproportionate numbers from communities that that shouldn't be there, you know, that, there shouldn't, that those numbers shouldn't, shouldn't be disproportionate, but the, the plan doesn't look at those needs. You know, there's a, there was a campaign announced today about how many Filipino people died in the pandemic. We don't sit and disaggregate our plans into those, those needs. And, and I, I do find that sometimes when asked to review something now, I'm a, I'm a poorer planner <laughs> than I was because even I was planning, I'd like to think, with care at scale, but even, even before this, I'd, I'd, I'd learnt to plan as numbers, hmm. and I wonder what that says about our field. There are two questions uh, from the our audience at home. So one is about grief. So when talking about grief, we often think about death. Do the speakers have any thoughts about grief of self for those whose lives were changed mm -hmm. because of illness yeah. at a personal level? And the second question is on the impact of the pandemic. So does the panel believe that a COVID inquiry can address this effectively and how confident are they that it can bring, can bring about effective change? Have a few there. <laughs> Would you like me to take that second question? <laughs> yes, well, please. Probably better than I should. <laughs> um, no, uh, unfortunately not. Um, the way that the inquiry, I mean, the inquiry is extraordinarily enormous in its scope and it's in, in, in the terms of reference. Um, Baroness Hallett, I believe, is trying to control and contain and, and channel the inquiry in a way that she feels is manageable and the lead counsel to the inquiry are, are supporting her in doing that and a massive amount of money is being spent already. There's huge volumes of material that's coming through in disclosure. Fundamentally, what, what the inquiry is not doing is hearing the voices of the people no. it needs to hear from. And the communication is dire already mm. with, with us as, a, as core participants representing Bruy families. Um, it's, it's not going to work. It's going to fail. Um, and which then takes us back to the idea of, you know, as Lucy writes about in her chapter about, you know, in days gone by you would have gone from campfire to campfire telling the stories and, and, and reminding people about what happened. You know, the, the essence of learning from all of our collective experience is our stories, uh, our humanity. And if we don't tell our stories and if we don't listen to our stories, then no one's going to learn anything and we're going to be right back here. Um, 
with your plans probably still on a shelf not being looked at by whoever's in charge. And your stories become too much for them. They're too Oh, we're they're too, too much. Real. We're the the award is too much. Yeah. yeah, you found that. Many people find that. Every week people yeah. are in tears because they can't believe, they can't comprehend that what they're seeing is actually no. what, what happened. But they're too much for the lawyers. They're too much for that space. We're too untidy yeah. and raw and They're too and untidy messy. and yeah. raw and could you get it into a 200 word template? Mm -hmm. Could you, you know, you do have a story to tell. Could, could you, you not know, do it in that Could you not do it in that way? way? You know, and, and um, I write, and I I know it's harmful to write that the inquiry won't work. I really agonised about that inclusion. But this inquiry, I've analysed 41 mass disaster inquiries in the UK. None of them have delivered what they've wanted. They do have some purpose, as I say in the book. Um, but they are, as I say in the book as well, Many on the day of the final report, many families report just feeling, wow. What, was that? Lot what was that for? What was that? Yeah. What was that? And they are a machine as well. Mm -hmm. So what you started to see towards the end of the Grenfell inquiry was possibly, some might say, some lawyers moving off to work on the COVID inquiry. You mm -hmm. saw the you know the data researchers are on substantial amounts of money. There's there's there's, there's years of work. Uh, and they got better desensitized. Mm -hmm. I genuinely believe, I have a lot of faith for some things in Lady Justice Hallett. The July the 7th inquiry was phenomenal, so it was done as an inquest, uh, but that was very contained mm. and boundaried. Um, it's, it's too big, and there are, but as I say in the book, there are other ways we will bring, we will bring change, I think. Mm. But sometimes I think families need to have the right to step away from these processes. These processes are not for them, but they are made to feel that if they... Uh, step away from the group or the not the group not the activist group but the group by which they're updated if they stop being a core, core participant they'll miss out on something from the state and so the inquiry process I would actually go so far as to say is abusive yeah I completely agree with that so if I can I go to the grief one yes of so course I, I think um, there was this moment so I didn't lose anybody I didn't live in grief for long, um, at the time and I didn't lose anybody very close to me at the time so I wasn't close they were you know people that you saw but they weren't close and I so I, I kind of like okay we're going to learn and I was very in action and pragmatic and writing letters and doing something and then I met somebody um, who's now a dear friend of mine and she said to me you're not grieving and I was like but I didn't lose anybody I've got nothing to grieve and she said you're of the community you need to grieve and I, I was like literally like what are, what are you talking about and then spent a week crying um, and then started therapy and five years later I'm still in therapy but um, I think there's there's this thing around what I call the, the hierarchy of grief mm -hmm. it's kind of like you have to and I think COVID is um, particular because it touched everybody in different ways and you know your grief is awful and unimaginable and then everybody is touched in a particular way and and I think sometimes there's a fear of if I haven't gone through what you've gone through then somehow my, my grief is invalid uh, and that stops the connection, the connection yeah. and it also just stops collective grieving which is mm. I think what's needed do you know it's just just uh because it's in that collective grieving that our humanity lives and connections emerge but i think that was a for me personally yeah, absolutely is like that this notion of the hierarchy of grief and that i had a right to have my grief in in my way and and because it hadn't been worse I should still look after myself and, and allow myself to grieve. And I think also, like, this is where I get sort of, you know, slightly x files but you, you write your pandemic plans, you don't, you don't, if you're writing on the aftermath, which Exercise Sickness was, uh, which was done in 2016, you don't stop at the pandemic. You look at the years afterwards, as I've already said. And really, um, bereavement gets in the way of us doing our work. So, you know, there was, this was, this is not entirely undeliberate that we, you know, we, it's all right for us academics maybe to stop and think about it, but really that society needs to carry on. And that, that was the perception that was coming out. And there was even kind of, 
it would be too far to say modelling, but sort of we there was going to have to be a lot of strong pressure on society at this point to not stop and take stock because stopping might mean people take some time off or not deliver. And it's come out in, in this country as strikes and also as high levels of slightly sort of unclear diagnosis of illness. And, um, you know, the, the, the virus, we always knew any kind of um, nasty either flu or pandemic or corona pandemic would bring a tail of long illness with it, which is done. But also that's very hard to disaggregate from a tale of somatic illness from unresolved trauma and grief and as Helen's question is alluding to there the loss of a life before as I say in when the dust settles her life the loss of a life before and also genuine long-term illness yeah. um, a loss of a sense of safety the 3,000 emergency planners are fine because we got to see what we wanted to see <laughs> I guess of course we didn't but but what, what the rest of the country suddenly had to deal with was the sense that, that hang on, this was a high-income country that had promised safety. Safe. Unless you already lived with precarity, unless you already lived on the edges, unless you already lived with institutionalised racism. You know, there was a, a, a certain strata of society that believed the state would keep them safe. And that is a loss to people that, that they... And now they, people say to me, I'm questioning everything. I'm like, I've been questioning everything since I'm 10. Yeah. I'm exhausted. <laughs> but that, that loss, it's not in the state's interest to acknowledge it. So this, I love your word, this is an act of resistance. Mm -hmm. And it is. It is. <laughs> I'm ready to resist. I was born for this moment. <laughs> if there's no further questions, we have to thank the panellists for their brilliant uh, interventions. So Grace May Bradley was an interim director of Liberty uh, and author of Against, uh, uh, Against Borders, The Case for Abolition, is going to read a poem. There is no poetry in the men who corralled us on the common to press down our sorrow and spring dusk rage. No lyric in their fluorescent creep, their intimidation and metal arrests. This is for your health, they spat. No safe distance for transgressors. We will be finding people and you need to leave now. There is nothing redeemable in the rank neatness of that night. The power that took a homegoing woman's life redeployed against her public grieving. When the hollow state is punishment, only the grotesque remains. Let her speak. We are here to blossom. Poetry. In the chorus of tar hot demand. In bodies warm and close and careful. Uncowed by the crush of order. Listen. The lyric in the naming as the light comes down. Police are the perpetrators. Shame on you. Listen, in the embers of our questions, who do you protect? And we move through those who'd shade our edges. Isolated incident, women and flowers. It's our incandescence they wilt in now, and law after law still cannot dim. So thank you very much, well, for the, the participants, for the, the, the panellists, for your, uh, for, and for the audience as well, for your questions and for being here. Uh, I think it was very important to listen to um, all these different uh, accounts and testimonies, many of them, several of them quite, quite poignant, poignant, very touching. Um, and I think it is, I, following it, this evening, it's really our duty uh, not, not to forget what happened and actually to demand, to give hell to the people, <laughs> uh, to give hell to the people, leaders, and uh, demand better, uh, a more caring, uh, a more caring state, a more caring uh, government, uh, more empathy, more generosity, uh, and allowing us, allowing us to, to live and flourish. <laughs>